Webb has been there before, the uh, member of the Michigan Fab Five, and he has a new memoir, By God's Grace. It'll be released on April 4th, and it's uh, a look into Chris's story in his own words, the uh, highs and lows on the court, off the court, and uh, the infamous timeout, the years that uh, he and his wife tried to uh, have a a child. They ended up having twins, never uh, before seen photos, personal stories, heartfelt tributes, to the most influential people in his life and his journey. And uh, Chris Weber, the Hall of Famer, back on the program. What was the toughest thing to write about, C. Webb? I think it was all of it, Dan. It's something I would never do again. Um, but I think it's one of my greatest accomplishments, taking about 12 years to write a book. I started off with just uh, the passion to do it. And I had to see if my words were real. So I got a stenographer. I would just speak to her and over months. And then uh, I, I took a crew back to Tunica, Mississippi, where I'm from, uh, uh, where my grandfather is from. And so really for me, this was just self-exploration of, you know, when you're playing basketball, you have blinders on. When you're working like you do, you have blinders on because you have to focus on what's ahead, not left or right. And so at the end of this journey, this basketball journey, um, I had a lot of thoughts and definitely uh, 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 some positions on things that have happened to me, but I wanted to go back and just see it through a different lens. And that's why I called the book By God's Grace, because uh, no matter how good you are in basketball, no matter how great of a journalist you are, no matter how great of a doctor you are, if you don't have something that's bigger than you, if people don't inspire you, if people don't feed you and that passion if i didn't have that village you know it wouldn't have been a great journey so it's it's really just a, a, a tribute and a thank you to those that that helped supported me since since i got here how ready were you to be a star when you got to michigan because th- this wasn't you get to the final four and you get recognition you guys got recognition early were you ready for it if, if I was ready for it, it's kind of a sad thing at 12. And I, I think I was ready for it. The first interview. So, Dan, that's what I talk about basketball. So I, I played this game in sixth grade. Uh, I always played in the neighborhoods. I knew I was good. But I go to this Christian school, Temple Christian, and I had a game there. And I had uh, 65 points, 15 <laughs> dunks, and like 15 assists. And I'm 12 years old. And so uh, at that point, you, you, you better have God in your life. You better have great people in your life because you can tend to think it's about you. Uh, you're still naive. You think that people's love is, is sincere. You don't know uh, the shenanigans that go on just amongst people. And so, yeah, I, unfortunately, I was prepared for it. I was thrusted into the spotlight at 12 years old. A recruiting issue started there with me and my friend Tom Izzo and Bill Frieda, who left at the time. So, unfortunately, yeah, six years later, we were I was all too prepared for it. Um, uh, uh, but I think that that helped us stay steady in the locker room. And the guys were, too. When you look at where Jawan came from, Cabrini Green, you look at Jalen's background and the strength of his uh, mother. Um, we, we, we all were prepared. We, all were, we were prepared as much as we could be for the whirlwind of, of the Fab Five. How did it not go sideways, given, up, given where you grew up? Damn. That, that's what I'm talking about in the book, brother. You know... It's so great to have parents that uh, are great parents, but they didn't want to be your friend. You know, they wanted to help you. And so me, just real quick, you know, Jalen and I played uh, basketball 12 years old. Best friends. Promised each other to go to the same high school. Um, my AAU coach comes in one day and says, listen, it's a great opportunity. They have scholarships at this school. And I wanted to go to Southwestern. I wanted to go to my city school. Well, my mother's a teacher. She taught at Mumford for Mumford High School 30, 40, 30 years Jamil Hill uh, famously went there. The Winans famously went there. And so I wanted to be part of the city of my mother, a teacher. She's like, no, are you are you stupid? This is an opportunity for education. It's an opportunity for friendships. And Dan, I tried to fell out. I tried not to. <laughs> I tried so many stupid things. And I just thank God that it wasn't that I didn't get to do what I wanted. And I learned that both in Country Day and Sacramento, where Sacramento was someplace I did not want to go. It was a trade on the table with the Lakers, some other things like that. You know, I wanted to win. I called a timeout. I thought that having this trophy would be like, see, okay, now y'all want to hear what I went through? And uh, it it didn't happen that way. And I remember my mother saying to me, you know, there's a blessing in Sacramento. And I remember it probably being the only time in my life, I'm a mama's boy, 
where I was like, Mom, I do not want to hear none of your homespun wisdom right now. Um, but it but it was right. It was the biggest blessing for me. So, yeah, I, I don't know how it didn't go sideways, Dan, because uh, one crazy story is before my first AAU game, uh, uh, one of my best friends got well, – best friends. One of my closest friends uh, was murdered, and he was 13. <laughs> so – I, I just thank God I made it. The safety of a village, the safety of good people around you and, and wonderful discipline and rules is definitely what, what kept me safe. Talking to Hall of Famer C. Webb, his uh, new memoir will be out uh, April 4th, Thursday, April 4th, by God's grace. Thinking about you coming on the show, realizing LSU women facing Iowa and race is playing a role in this. Hmm. When Michigan played Duke, race played a role in this. When you're in that moment, you're a freshman, how do you process that? You know, us against the world, because Duke probably thought it was us against the world from their perspective. So first of all, Baltimore, Barbie and Caitlin, I, I love their game. This is the first year I probably know more women's names than, than men's names. And yeah. that's Steph Curry, because they'll walk in the gym and outshoot any man in the world. But um, when I say we were prepared for it, Dan, you know, you know how my father worked at the factory of Detroit for 40 years. He was a, he was in the UAW. He uh, came from Mississippi and had to work on the farm. Like, uh, uh, what could I complain about when I compared it to his life? And so when we talk about racism or other things, we knew it and we would have discussions amongst ourselves. I mean, I don't know too many kids uh, that got praised and death threats at the age of 18 and 19 like we did. But I think, again, it was our village. It was the coaches. It was the great students around us. It was other friends, you know, to let you live in that naivety where, oh, it's a death threat, but you have enough distraction, positive distraction uh, to keep you going forward. And I also think us being from Detroit, Chicago and other places where we have seen people not make it. It's almost like um, the racism is way more than an emotion, way more. It hurts. It stops you physically. It it spreads a narrative. Uh, that, that you don't want. It doesn't reinforce the principles of your parents and other things. But however, we, we were from Detroit and, and we knew that we were the underdogs in life and that our job was to work harder and that in our position, you almost had to be 10% better or work 10% harder to get a fair narrative. So I think our backgrounds prepared us for coming into conservative areas that wasn't ready for the youth. And it was racism, Dan, but it was also the movement of the time. Like everyone in our age group at that time was kind of speaking out and standing up, whether it was hip hop, TV shows and others. So we also felt like we were in a larger community fighting for that independence of being, having the freedom to be who we wanted to be. What is it like though, to be us against the world in your mind? It's two sides. So let's, let's, let's start with the less positive side. It's lonely. Uh, you can't express yourself because if you express yourself, you're complaining. Uh, you're talking to people that uh, don't have enough context. In other words, someone will say to you, uh, I, I heard someone say this to a friend of mine that played basketball and, and his mother passed. But at least you got all that money. If I was you, you know, and I'm thinking, what the hell does that have to do with that? So that can be a lonely place. Um, and it can also isolate you because if you keep getting frustrated enough, you don't want to bring people down. You also may have survivor's remorse in complaining to someone that doesn't have what you have. Right. That's one side. That's that's the bad side. Now, the good side is, so what? It's the world. Don't nobody love us anyway. It is what it is. There are no excuses. What the baby's going to do. I don't know where that phrase came from, Dan, what the baby's going to do, but that's been something I've held in my life since a young guy. And I don't know why whoever said it said it, but I got it. It's like we're all on our own. And so if you have that strength but can keep the love and the passion, then I think it can all work together. Where I've seen people struggle is where that loneliness creates bitterness and they become a person that they're not always angry at things that didn't happen or them being in that role of them against the world. So hopefully you have enough context to be able to put things in their proper place and address them when needed to be, when they need to be. Now we have NIL. Is it weird to see it after what you went through at Michigan? No. 
uh, NIL still has to go to another level. So even in Michigan, we would talk about how the NCAA was a uh, was was a 501c3. We would talk about the fact that Nike brought gym shoes. We picked out Hirachis. I have a wonderful story in the book about we're the first team ever to pick out the shoe that would lead college and things like that. So when we wore black socks and the next weekend, it was 250,000 pair of black socks reportedly sold. <laughs> we turned our Nike shirts inside out the next game. And, and these are things in the documentary and other things I wish people would have talked about just besides the dunks, because all the substance is always missed in what we went through. Like the questions you're asking, how, how do you handle you against the world? You're a bunch of 18 year old knuckleheads. You don't even still going through puberty. How do you handle this? And, it was the seniors, it was the juniors, it was everyone because we all were together. But we knew from our influence, we, we didn't have cable when you were doing uh, sports center. So we didn't have cable in our, in our rooms and things. And so when we would go home in the summer or travel and saw, we went to Yugoslavia at the time and other places at the time, um, we saw that we had an impact around the world. And there's a famous story of me and a reporter, uh, who came to see me in Michigan and I was with a football player and we didn't have enough to get a Subway sandwich and some chips. And when that story came out publicly, um, a lot of athletes around the country uh, really started hitting me and, and understanding the plight. And so how was it? It was tough. Uh, it's not what was said. I addressed the Ed Martin and all that great stuff in the book. So we, we did not avoid anything. I finally had the context and time to talk about it. Um, but the NI, I mean, it's, it's unfair. Put it like this, before Bill Russell passed away, this is an interview on TNT. I'm sure it'll be hard to find. Uh, but he uh, likened uh, NCAA to uh, very unsavory practices uh, that happened in America early. And he was saying, if you don't own your name, if you can't get paid, then how do you move forward? So I'm glad to see that we're moving forward. I love the NCAA. I love everything that's happening. But, you know, there's a, there's a reckoning. There's a reckoning coming, and I'm glad that these young, smart students um, hopefully are, are galvanized and hopefully work together so that no athlete is left behind. And you've been generous with your time talking about the timeout, what that meant to you, naming your charity after that. But I'm wondering the role that your parents played in getting you to that point to understand, Chris, this is not going to define you this is going to make you even stronger. That's why, Dan, I'm jealous that you get to interview people, you know, from your, from your level, because I can't imagine how much insight you, you've gotten. I used to always watch the old football documentaries or anything, looking for that worst point in their life. Reggie, Reggie White said this and came back and played. I always looked for that. And so with the timeout, when I talk about God's grace in the village, I call the timeout. It's the worst moment of my life. It's lonely. I'm a mama's boy. I go home and get some mama's love. I'm the oldest of five. I got brothers teasing me. My neighborhood's bustling. Everything's great or everything's bad. I, I come in and my, I have a letter, first of all, from Bill Clinton, a handwritten letter saying, you know, get up. I get these shoes from Jackie Joyner Kersey, the shoes that she wore in the Olympics and won as a gold medal. I had so much love and support from people around the world that that really sustained me. But my mother came in the living room and she said, um, and, and my mother's, she doesn't have vanity plates. She doesn't drive a, my mother is the most humble woman you would ever see. And she goes, uh, look what I got, baby. And it was a time, it was a license plate. And it said time out. And I'm like, <laughs> no. and she's like, yeah, you know, whatever that means, whatever the, whatever, uh, the devil meant for bad, God meant for good. And we're going to do some great things. And what was so great is she was a teacher. So her and my aunt Charlene had already planned these charity events coming up to the draft. You know, I called the timeout around April 4th, April 5th. The draft is June 30th. Like, how can that happen in Detroit? Like, I had to research, how the hell did the draft get to be in Detroit? <laughs> you know, and how was Shaq's draft in Portland? Like, what's going on? But for my mother saying that, uh, to every year a child was born in, in a Detroit hospital, we would give uh, the families books. We wanted to combat um, um, reading disparities and things like that. And when, when I saw my mom do it, it was like, how can you be ashamed, man? You better go ahead and do your thing. And she doesn't care about basketball. So that's that's how my mom helped define me. My father, you know, cowboys give you a pat on the back, son. It's okay. And, you know, when it rains, get wet, something like that, you know. But my mom was <laughs> like, no, we're really going to do this. So I thank God for my parents because I don't 
I don't know how I would have been able to frame those worst moments if I would have had people that uh, were not strong uh, emotionally and stable. How do you thank your parents? All right. So there's no way to do it. My father, he gave <laughs> my father. He's something. Else. So, I, OK, I thank my father. I, I saw him cry when I when we did the Bill Russell interview. And Bill Russell walked over to him and said, you know, you did a great job. You're a good man and a whole bunch of things. And that was I didn't do that, but I paid for his ticket to come with me. So I'm going to say I did that. But so it's the day before draft. And I called my dad. I said, Magic Johnson's coming over tomorrow. He's coming over in the morning, man. You know, please have the house clean and stuff like that. He wants to talk to you about <laughs> like, hey, all this. My mother calls me. No lie, at like six in the morning, she's like, what did you tell your dad? He's cutting the grass. You can't, you can't. <laughs> so I have my father pumped up. So the whole neighborhood, you know, the whole neighborhood is, is like hiding and, and, and looking out. So I go to the Cadillac dealership and I walk in the Cadillac dealership and everybody starts clapping. And it wasn't for me. It was because they knew my dad had worked at Cadillac all these years and never had a Cadillac. So, uh, make a long story short, I get the car, drive it up on the lawn, which is a cardinal sin in our household. He comes out, boy, what's wrong with you? I said, Dad, look. And I throw him the keys, he's smiling, everybody's looking around him, and he just gets in the car real smooth and drives off around the block, and he comes back and goes, when is magic coming? I said, man, magic coming, man, how the car? So, I, I think, you know, it's definitely gifts and things like that, but I think I think the biggest way to repay them is just to let them know the impact, the small things, the times when they weren't yelling, punishing, disciplining, that I heard what they said. And not only did I hear it, I believe it, and I took it in. And so um, hopefully the stories that I tell, hopefully reminding them that I know I would not be this strong without their guidance, hopefully that's enough for them because I could never repay them back. Great to talk to you. Look forward to reading the book. Thank you. You're the man. Thank you, Dave, for having me. That's uh, Chris Weber, Hall of Famer. His new memoir is called By God's Grace. It'll be released Thursday, April 4th.